Well, I want to welcome everyone to our 2010 IBM lecture. For those of you who don't know, the IBM lecture is made possible by a generous gift from the IBM Corporation, whose former chairman and CEO, Mr. John Opel, is a distinguished Westminster graduate and life trustee of our board. Since 1980, this lecture series has brought leaders in the business and finance field and professors of economics and business administration to our campus to share their wisdom with the Westminster community. Now, before I introdu introduce today's IBM lecturer, I'd like to acknowledge a few special guests. Traveling with Walter Hester uh, are Ms. Marcia Bordeaux, Marcia, and Walter's, and Walter's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Walter Hester. Great to have you here. Mr. Mike Dalton, who is the president of Maui Gym. Mike. Tim Kruger, who is the chief financial officer for Maui Gym. Rhonda Bussard, who is the vice president for human resources at Maui Gym. Chris McLean. Chris, where are you? From Maui Gym. And Chris Abruzzi, uh, Vice President for Advertising for my region. And also Mr. Charlie Baldwin, a longtime friend of Walter and his wife Marjorie. Tur turns out Charlie and I went to the same high school in Hawaii, although I pre predated him by a few years. One or two, just a few. So it's a real pleasure for me to introduce this afternoon's lecturer. Not only are we welcoming back one of Westminster's own, but we are saying aloha to someone whose Westminster education helped pre prepare him to build and lead a very successful global enterprise. More importantly, we're welcoming a man who lives Westminster's mission every day through his company's philosophy, which he's selected for today's title living aloha. Walter Hester, our IBM lecturer, graduated from Westminster in 1977, where he majored in business administration and was a member of the Sigma Chi fraternity. Okay. After graduation, he worked for Shell Oil Company in the field of advertising, and in 1983, his life went a different direction after he left Shell Oil and relocated to our 50th state. There he found himself connected with a small company selling sunglasses on the beaches of Maui and later throughout the Hawaiian Islands. Fortunately, the company realized that the sunglasses they were selling were not, not quite doing the job that it was intended to do, nor were the sunglasses, any other sunglasses on the market. There was a need for sunglasses that would eliminate the dramatic glare of Hawaii but not distort the beautiful colors of the scenery. The technology of Polarized Plus emerged and was patented, and Maui Jim sunglasses gained an advantage that no other sunglass company could match. When Walter Hester purchased the company in 1991, Maui Jim had seven employees. Today, the company has over 600 employees and 11 offices worldwide. Maui Jim is the fastest growing polarized sunglass maker in the world and the company has been recognized with many awards, including Forbes magazine, 100 things worth every penny. And here at Westminster, anyone who is associated with high praise from Forbes magazine <laughs> is a good thing for us. Golf Digest, the best sunglasses for golf, and as a golfer, I can attest to that, although it didn't improve my game, and advertises Advertising Ages Marketing 50 uh, list of the biggest success companies. Walter himself was awarded the ESA Visionary Award by the European Sunglass Association. As we will hear in a moment, Maui Jim's success rests on an unwavering devotion to quality and customer service, as well as a complete alignment of corporate values and business practices. 
That's an important lesson for all of us to understand, particularly in this economy. Quality, both product and service, plus values equals success. That's good math anytime. Now in the Westminster tradition, Walter also believes in giving back and making a difference in the world. His company hosts annual fundraisers and events to benefit the elderly, children at risk, the homeless, low-income families, and cancer victims. For Walter Hester, it's always, always about people. And today he's going to share with us some stories of the principles that have led him to the top of his field as CEO of Maui Jim Sunglasses and that have propelled this great company to prominence in a competitive international market. I want all of us at Westminster to pay close attention to Walter's message and to Maui Jim's story. We will learn what it means to be a successful business leader of character in a global community. But before Walter comes to the podium, I think it's very important for all of us, and me included, to get into the Aloha spirit. <laughs> so I want to shed my button-down collar look and get into the Aloha spirit so that we can all learn how to name Aloha. <laughs> so please join me in a warm Westminster College Blue Jay Aloha to our very own Walter Hester. Must have been really hot. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Forsyth. It's, it's good to be here. But first, I have to start this out with aloha. <laughs> so I'm very honored and humbled to be in front of you today. I feel like I'm back at Westminster to take the hardest exam of my life. <clears throat> I don't actually remember preparing this hard for any test I took here. <laughs> so uh, maybe Dr. Forsythe, you can give me a little extra credit on my old GPA. <laughs> I learned a lot at, th at this school when I was here. I also learned even more but didn't quite realize the full scope of all the information that I gathered and absorbed here as a student. Later in life, the light bulb sort of goes on. And you say to yourself, oh, that's what that teacher meant. <laughs> but I think if you have the honor of t attending the school, you are definitely in the 1%. This, this school is just it's like no other. The uh, student-teacher ratio is one thing but the quality of that ratio and what you can get out of the school, you're very fortunate, believe me. As much as you plan or prepare yourself, you can never predict what the future is going to bring you. And I'm li living proof of that. It's very rarely that it works out exactly how you think it will. But also in saying that, I think it's important that you plan and prepare for what you think will transpire. It's important to know the basics inside and out, of course, with regards to business fundamentals. To me, it's most important to know your own strengths and your weaknesses. You must be very comfortable with taking this type of objective view to really look at your pluses and your minuses. And then you must work hard every day to improve all your talents, both good and bad. 
if you know everything and think you're the best, the only direction you can go is downhill. Now I want to talk a little bit about after, after leaving the school and, and uh, as Dr. Forsythe said, my, well this is uh, this an interesting picture, this is over, <laughs> over at the William Woods uh, Loop and uh, that's me without any shoes on again. <laughs> Yeah, and there's, there's some other people in this room, but I won't uh, pick them out. But this is me in the uh, overalls and the hat. <laughs> but, but after school, I went to, to work for Shell Oil, and um, really a, a, just a great company. Very smart people, um, a great company. Uh, at first, I worked in sales, and then um, probably the, the last five years of that, I was in marketing and advertising with them. But it was very interesting for me because um, in Shell you had, of course, much more people smarter than me, but we had sort of phone books of what we could do and what we couldn't do and, and um, well thought out by very smart people. Um, but to me, um, it really didn't quite apply what kind of goes on in New York. Would it be the same thing in Los Angeles? or? or let's say in other countries. So, so that's one of the things that I looked at that I said, well, if, if, if I was there, I'd kind of do things a little different. But anyway, after about, I think, nine years with Shell, then uh, came to the, the position um, that I wanted to work for myself. And, and when I first started with them, um, I basically was working with the gas stations and uh, the, they were all entrepreneurs and they had their own business and this was seemed attractive to me so but anyway it, after about nine years I went and um, sold everything and cashed in my pension and sold my house and just said I'm going to uh, Maui and um, actually had a sister and a brother that were living there so um, I'd been out for a couple times on vacation but I thought that Maui was going to grow, and, and it definitely did. But um, anyway, I just decided, and I didn't know what business I was going to do, so I went just to look at different things. I went through a lot of different types of businesses looking. Uh, first off, I went to look to find a gas station, and, but uh, no one wanted to sell their gas station, and to build one was um, crazy uh, as far as the permits in Hawaii. But, um, and then I came across, I was going to do sailboat charters. And um, anyway, I got, went on to get my captain's license. And, and to get my captain's license, I had to work on a boat so many days. And, and of course, go through the courses and take tests. But, but uh, there was a company that came up out to the boats. And they said, if you're a captain of the boat, um, we'll sell you these glasses half price. And you deal with the tourist. And if you could put in a good word for us, we'd appreciate that. So I bought my first pair of Maui Jim sunglasses and, and then my whole business uh, outlook changed and said, well, I don't know if the sailboat's such a great idea, maybe these glasses. Because um, the, the people that, that had the glass, they had two retail locations, they didn't do any wholesale glass or wholesale business at all. And basically, they, they had the uh, pool decks for the Sheraton and also the uh, Maui's, or I'm sorry, the Marriott. And they sold suntan lotion and handed out towels and, and sold these glasses. And uh, this is the original guy here. <laughs> anyway, I, I <laughs> that, that's definitely not me. <laughs> but, uh, Anyway, so I, after I got these glasses, I tracked them down, and I, I said, like, I just see them these two places. Uh, are you interested in selling the distributorship? And, and it took a long time to convince them, but come to find out later, they had tried to sell wholesale, but they went into the stores, and people would say, you know what, um, I just want something that someone's going to walk in and say, I want that, and here's the money, and out the door. So, um, so 
in the end, they said, okay, we'll sell you the distributorship for Hawaii. And I purchased that. And um, he sold some other distributorships on the mainland uh, after mine. But I think I probably sold 85% of all the glasses um, through Hawaii. And then shortly after that, a couple of years, uh, the company went bankrupt. And um, this was, uh, you know, a big thing because you, to myself, I'm thinking, well, here's a great product, but yet it's, it's the company's bankrupt. And um, so I think uh, in my mind, it's, it was, well, one, mismanagement, but two, you know, it really comes down to the people. And that was a, a big thing for me that here's this great product, but no product sells itself, no product fixes itself. And, uh, and really, it, it comes down to the people. So um, to kind of protect what I would built up um, as far as in Hawaii, because we sold 85%, and I built a you know, pretty good business in Hawaii, I purchased the whole company out of bankruptcy. And uh, there, shortly after, I purchased back to all the distributors. And a lot of these distributors were just they had glasses in their closets, and it was each operation was a little different. But I think too, and, and of course these values are here, you know, definitely in the Midwest. But but uh, as a company, we like to talk about it as Aloha or the Aloha spirit. And I think it's things that will that you'll feel that. That's here at the school, and that's in other places. But um, I think this all puts it in per into perspective. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the Aloha spirit. So in 1850, the, the sugarcane companies came to Hawaii, and and they offered the Hawaiians to work in the fields and live live in the company housing, and purchase their groceries at the company store, and um, and they offered them very minimal pay. And so, you know, I want to say, you know, a dollar for the month or something like that. But, but most importantly, um, they really didn't allow the time for the people to um, nurture their culture and their religion and their way of life. It was basically a 15-hour day working in the fields. Well, the Hawaiians were smart enough to say, you know, the heck with that. Money's not everything. You know, my culture and, and, and other things that we're doing are, are very important too. And then, of course, the cane company says, you know, damn, those Hawaiians are lazy. <laughs> but, but really, the Hawaiians were, were very smart, and it was a, a very, um, it was a very good uh, call on their, their part. But where this is leading is that what transpired is they imported all these workers from Japan, Philippines, Tongans, Portuguese, I mean, on and on and on. And all these, these people or cultures moved to Hawaii and, and they harvest the cane and they built all the infrastructure as far as the, the roads and the bridges and the waterways. And, and right now, today in Hawaii, there is not a dominant race, race, or, or, or I'm sorry, culture, color, or religion. And, you know, even though the aloha word goes way back in the Hawaiian vocabulary, I think this put really the aloha spirit to test. Because um, in my mind, uh, let me give you kind of my meaning of aloha. And it's to have respect for different cultures, race, religion, and beliefs. Also, to live harmoniously with one another. To, and again, to treat people as you would want to be treated. And also to understand in life that we are all dependent on each other. To, op to operate 
within this Loa spirit not only elevates, empowers, and ennobles people. So I'm here today to tell you how Maui Jim puts this type of Loa spirit into our everyday business. Um, this is a slide. This is um, one part. So I'm going to just kind of section off each one. This this little section I'm going to talk about employees, and and down here in the left corner we have a, like a state of the art gym. It's 24 hours. The employees can come in and use it. We bring in trainers, um, special classes. Just just something that we don't have to do, but makes their their quality of life better. Um, this is a group of employees fishing. This is just uh, some guys having fun. This is actually a group on their own got together and they decided that they're going to wear shorts and flip flops um, throughout the winter. And whoever lasted the longest got a free pair of Maui gems. So. <laughs> and this is just uh, team building. It, it, we had to build a boat just uh, some fun stuff that we try to do with, with our employees to get that unity and, uh, and bond. But uh, I feel that our people uh, is by no question our most important asset. And we try to create the, create the happy environment. Also, um, each employee has a chance to own stock in the company, even though that we're not a public company, we're private. Um, as far as benefits, uh, probably I think we pay 45% or 50, almost 50%, whatever your salary is, that person also gets about 45, 47% in, in bonus, or I should say benefits, whether it's medical, bonuses, what have you. Um, and we do things a little different. Everyone has bonuses, not just the salespeople. We have it for the people that, that are, you know, janitors and shipping and advertising, everything. Um, we also don't, don't put any caps on those bonuses. So it's kind of like if the company does great, you do great. But most of all, we want to make sure that we connect that person, that, that they can make a difference, that you know, one person can make uh, a big change in, in what we do. <clears throat> and I think another thing is, too, that's very important, we, we try to let them be themselves. We, we're not looking for a cookie cutter type situation where you, know, you have to dress like this and, be like this. In fact, we don't have a dress code. We don't have any assigned parking places. Uh, well, except if, if you're pregnant, you do get a assigned parking <laughs> place. <laughs> we don't have any time clocks. We don't have uh, video surveillance inside. But um, most of all, um, and I wish you could, could really meet all our employees because everyone is is totally different. I mean, totally different. I mean, one's a hunter, one's likes ballet. I mean, you know, one's country western and one's metal rock. So, um, but somehow we find that unity or a common thread that pulls all them together, and we call it our Aloha spirit. I think it's important that that, uh, you know, in work that you also create a passion and a purpose in the workplace. And uh, we try to come up with creative wa ways to do that, but most of all, make sure that that person feels like they can make a difference. Um, also, I think you have to be truthful and consistent in your policies, and I think that's just good business wherever you are. Um, and then we always try to, to help with, with other people's or other employees' uh, successes, but also acknowledge those achievements. Um, 
And this is probably one of the biggest things. You, I think you have to trust the people and uh, give them the leeway and the authority. And uh, if you really look at Maui Gym and the structure, we have very, very few people for what we do. And, and if you're in customer service or repairs, that person that picks up the phone when you dial in has the authority to give you a free pair of glasses or do whatever they need to to really satisfy that person and make them happy. Our goal is really to ex exceed one's perceptions or um, when it comes to something like that as far as repairs or, or where we get to touch you know, that customer. But also, in other areas too, our sales reps have a lot of authority. It's not that they really have to, are calling their managers every day, can we do this, can we do that? Um, we also try to, for each state, of course there's, it's different logistics and people, but uh, for instance, we'll do like a national advertising program, but then we also set out a separate budget for each rep to try to create their own program, what they would like to invest in as far as advertising. And it's amazing the creativity that, that comes from that. Um, and this is another big one on my list that you have to listen to them. Listening is, is one of the most important things in, in, in some businesses. Uh, I just don't know it, that it happens. Um, training is key. Um, and then we are really striving to teach those employees to be teachers. Um, we try to cross train our employees so if they're in customer service, they can switch over to here and they know that business. And, and in addition to that, if they, if they understand someone else's job better, then it enables them to their, do their job that might affect that person in, in a more um, efficient manner. So, um, and then of course, our product um, is a high premium, you know, sunglass. And if I put two products up here on the table, you might not see really any difference, but you definitely, you know, there's a dollar difference. There might be a $150 difference. You say, well, those look the same. But I think that all comes with knowledge and training. And of course, our people really don't touch the customer very often. We get to touch the customer maybe on a repair. So we're really um, key on trying to train those people that buy our glasses in the store, and we think knowledge is everything. Um, and another big one, I think, is, is you have to ask for the commitment from your employee. It's very important. But just as important, you have to let them know that the company is behind them, too. It's, that's a two-way street. I'm going to move on to kind of how on customers, how we do the Aloha spirit. And again, it's, it's kind of the same, but it's, you know, we want to treat them, you know, as, as we would like to be treated. And I'll kind of split this up a little bit with retail. I think these slides, um, these are some, some events in the stores that we do for our customers. Um, one of our big thing is not just selling in the product, but, but uh, really programs and different types of things to push that product through their store. And one is training, two is promotions and events and working with the people. Um, as far as Maui Gym goes, we don't want to be sold everywhere. We try to be selective. Um, just like our employees, we ask that that customer make a commitment to us um, and then we make a commitment to them so so we don't try to be, just be every store and take every opportunity 
Um, we also, as far as the customers, we try to make them feel part of the team. We're constantly asking them for their input and what they'd like to see. Um, boy, this web thing is great. We've got their customers dialed in that we can send out a message and get information um, very quickly. And uh, I think that's very important that they feel like they're they're making or they're what they have to say makes a difference in our policy. Um, and I think this goes along with that too. Um, as far as developing strategies, make sure that you know you go to your customers and get their their put their interests in mind when you, when you're putting your strategy together. Um, Of course, we talked about sell-through. Some some of the other things that we do is, is if an order comes in at by two o'clock in the afternoon, um, it, it's guaranteed that it goes out by five. Um, I'll give you some examples too of in the past. Um, we deal with with Costco with our discontinued models, and before that, I think we've been dealing with them maybe. Um, probably eight, nine years. Great company to work with. Um, prior to that, all the other companies, when they got a little bit overloaded with inventory, they would sell that product to Costco and just, you know, take that off their books. Um, but, um, and also Costco is very, very, very good. They're very smart. And we had a problem with them buying gray market, which is is they we weren't selling them the glasses, but they they get that get those glasses from other people and put that in their stores, and that kind of disrupted our market. But we went to Costco and we said, you know, we got to stop the gray market, and if we stop that, we'll sell you our discontinued styles. And they said, great, we signed an agreement, and and they've been a, a great partner to work with. But what we did is we did a little different. We went to the accountant and said, hey, we're, we're, we're gonna sell Costco or discontinue, and we're gonna send you a letter three months before we discontinue it, and if you have any of that product, send it back to us, and we won't charge any re restocking fee, and you'll know that any product sold in Costco is not, is not a, uh, a current, you know, SKU or style. And so it was something different, but uh, we've been doing it a long time and it's worked well. But I think, again, it's just being honest with your customer, looking out for their best interests. Something, um, another example uh, with the customers, 9-11. Uh, um, if you remember that, it was such a, a crazy time. Um, you know, all the companies, I think, you know, didn't really realize um, what what was going to happen. Um, what we decided as a company is we went to um, all our customers and we said, um, you know what, um, and especially the ones in Hawaii and Caribbean and in uh, vacation resort type areas, um, because basically no one in the U.S. or or anywhere was traveling or going to these places. And we went to them and we said, I know it's crazy right now. I know your business is way off. Um, we can extend dating on the product that you have in stock. You can pack it up, ship it back to us. We will send you a check by FedEx. And I said, uh, and basically also told them that, you know, you hope that you think of us when your customers return. So... That's another one, and, and we make um, also um, different deals with maybe seasonal customers and just whatever stock you have at the end of the year or your season, send it back to us and we'll write you a check. So I think it's, um, you know, policies that are very different from other companies in our business. Um, also, we have return policies that we don't charge a restocking fee. If they have a style that just doesn't sell, send it back, we'll trade you for a new one, or we'll write you a check. So, um, Some examples of maybe 
the end user or customer. Um, for instance, when Katrina happened, um, we got all the zip, zip codes in that area that were affected by uh, Katrina. And anyone that called in from those zip codes for a um, repair, their glasses got damaged um, because of the, the flooding, uh, we fix those for free. So, um, like when you call in on our warranty system, um, we try to be very lenient in that. Um, we're kind of looking at maybe taking a full page out in Sports Illustrated. I think and this was a long time ago. I think it was about fifty thousand dollars. I said, well, you know, what could be uh, even the best advertising <laughs> would be to really exceed someone's expectation. And as a company, we, we rarely get to touch our end user. It's, it's, it's funny because we don't have a retail store. So we're very lenient on our repairs and, and really try to make the, the customer happy, even if they had a bad experience and the, the product broke. So we're pretty lenient on that. Um, and I think that's come back. We, we said to ourselves, well, if I was going to buy a pair of glasses, if my best friend came to me and told me that, well, there's this great sunglass and they took care of a, a repair or a problem and did it in a, in a fast um, amount of time, that would be more meaningful than seeing an ad in, in some newspaper. But um, for instance, like our phone system, when you call in, um, right now, um, phones are answered in 15 seconds. Um, you, you talk to a live person, um, our people can pull up different screens, so it's not that uh, if you say, well, I'm looking for something that's being shipped or I'm looking for a warranty, that same person can answer all those questions. Um, we have a policy sort of in-house that if a repair comes in into our shop, uh, any, of, any of our DCs, that um, it's repaired and out the door in three days. And if it's not, then the report comes to me. <laughs> but um, so I think, you know, we were just, um, and we've had, um, you know, products too that, um, because we're always, in trying to introduce new products that the market's never seen. So we, we have had some issues where um, we found out once we released a product that, that uh, it was a little bit faulty. But we always stood behind that product and, and made sure that we also admitted that problem. Said, yes, we did have problems with that. We'll fix that for free and we'll get this back to you. Um, and then also I think Aloha applies to our suppliers. And, uh, <laughs> this is um, on the right here is uh, Mr. Nakanishi and he's, um, he's from Osaka, he's from Japan. He's very big in the optical business. I've, I've done business with him since I first got started with Maui Jim, that's in 86. The man in the middle is, is uh, Mr. Vitrini, he's an Italian lens maker. Um, both these gentlemen are, are like at the top of their game. They're like the best, the best, best in the world. And uh, they are also competitors. And somehow, and, and it's funny because they always, the unknown, they, you know, God, what's he doing over there? What's he doing? But somehow, we have brought them together. Um, they're not doing any projects together, but at least they're, they're friends now. <laughs> but um, in the Italian, we, we've been with about, I want to say, 16, 17 years, too. So both long term. Um, I'm approached every day of people you know, we can do that cheaper, we can do that, you know, better. Um, when they say better, then I ask them that Missouri slogan, show me. But um, really, 
These two gentlemen um, really know that um, research and development, new products are the key. Um, as a company, I'm a small niche market, so I have to have something that's exclusive to Maui Gem to really compete with some of the, the big guys out there. So we're all together trying to constantly you know, come up with new product that no one else has or, or really uh, we try to pick technology maybe from larger cap markets um, you know, like the, the Flexon frames come from the space industry and there's a lot of different uh, tech technologies out there. Our plax plastic lens, we're able to develop that from um, actually instant disposable cameras and then took that technology a, a step further. But I think the main thing is, is that um, um, we really try to instill trust and also loyalty you know, to our suppliers and that we're all in it together. Um, I take the extra step to try to understand their business. An uh, example of that would be in manufacturing you need basically production sort of steady and the same amount for all 12 months. Um, of course, we have a peak season during the summer. But so we try to step back and we try to make process our orders and give those equally to help them. And in return, that lowers their costs, which they pass on to us. So. But um, I think just to be straightforward and honest and uh, it's um, interesting, but um, when you go through a really tough or bad situation, um, I think that's when you know it's, it's the perfect chance for you really to become a true bond as far as a supplier and manufacturer. Um, the Italian gentleman, I think um, we had a sort of a, a fix. Uh, when the yen, when the, I'm sorry, when the euro uh, first came out, it was a, like at 80, 80 cents to the dollar. It went, then went on to went up, you know, almost a, a dollar seventy. I think it's in the mid 130s right now. But we actually had a contract with the Italian sl supplier um, at a fixed price, and thing jumped so much, you know, 40 points. Um, and, you know, I went to him and basically said, I know that I have a contract with you. I know that you will honor that. But I also know that the dollar has, has you know, also is doing the seesaw on the other side. And I said, you know, I understand your position. And we just ripped up the contract. I said, you know, you will help me one day, and and he has. So we went through many um, different situations with um, the Japanese gentleman. He he started Oakley, he started Revo, he's done all these lines. But uh, anyway, <coughs> I think um, it's really your character when you get into a bad situation, and you that's a chance for you really to, um, you know, get ahead of the pack. So I think, um, you know, your, your reputation, your loyalty, and just, just being straightforward and honest, it sounds like basic things, um, but that goes a long way. Um, talk about a little bit with, about the environment. Um, this is, um, a state-of-the-art lab um, that we have in Peoria, Illinois, and um, this is 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 brand new to the U.S. In fact, the as far as um, reducing our it's it's sort of a green lab, or but it's it's something that we had built, so it was the first one in the U.S. But this will reduce the lens weight from like 20 to one but um, it really recycles it all. And uh, it keeps about, I don't know, 80,000 80, pounds of plastic out of our 
waste dumps. But in addition to that, um, everything, all the waste that comes out, we recycle, which is, which is kind of neat. Um, like, for instance, our brochures are all recycled paper. Um, and right now we're work looking at different frames and lenses that are, are recyclable, so I'd like to see more of that. Um, we're also coming out with the fishing sunglass line that will, every a certain percentage of sale will go back to a foundation that cleans up our ocean. So, so we're very aware of that. And, uh, and uh, there's a lot of other projects that we're doing too, but, but it's good for us to be. And so I guess now we'll talk a little bit about community. We, we feel that uh, we're all <clears throat> on this planet together and we're all dependent on each other. And these are some of the charities that we get behind and do. And I think one of the most important things is that we just don't put a collection thing, but we really get our people involved. And, and it's just amazing what satisfaction our employees get out of doing this. So, um, and we could go through all the numbers, but we've, we've got a lot of good causes that, that, uh, that we have, and we feel that um, you, know, you have to give back to com community. That's what it's all about. Um, I'll talk a little bit about international business. Usually, I don't separate that because we just kind of, I kind of look at it all the same, but I know it's one of the missions of the, of the college, so in this speech, I'm going to separate it a little bit. But I'll talk about how we kind of determine a market, and, and kind of up on our radar, we'll, we'll, we'll see different countries that, you know, have, has the right demographics for our product, uh, and we are a premium, expensive product. Um, and then after we kind of do that, then we, we do our research on it. Um, and then I think it's very important that you get, you know, really good uh, legal help that's in that country because each country is so different. I know in France, we started a corporation in France and, and basically we found out about four years later we couldn't sell any t-shirts or apparel because we had set up the corporation wrong. <laughs> anyway, we had to go back, and, and it was very costly to, to change that. But, but I think that's um, you know, just a given that you have to really get someone that's very smart. Then you have to pick a person um, you know, that's um, familiar with, with your business and that country and really try to pick uh, you know, someone very bright. Uh, um, by the way, um, we have 11 foreign offices, and not that we really strive for this, but we, we don't employ one American in all 11 foreign offices. And um, we really feel like we need someone that's from that culture, that understands that business. Um, and, you know, you can go through all the differences, um, you know, some charge for shipping, some don't charge for shipping. Those are easy to figure out. But, um, but I guess what um, I'm trying to say, you have to find the person that's, that's really um, understands your product and, and also those markets. Uh, we went to also to to pick a location, we went to the experts, and and our first, um, besides Canada, our first foreign market was uh, France, and of course all the experts said, well, you have to be in Paris, and but then we we thought, well, you know what they would tell us to be in New York City, yet Peoria works fabulous for us. <laughs> So we kind of did the same thing in, in the different countries too. Uh, instead of going to Paris, we went to Montpellier. Uh, basically we're looking for a location that has a good workforce, um, also that has an international airport. Um, and sometimes 
you know, by picking the lesser, you know, major city, uh, we can get, um, you know, a much higher caliber person, um, and just not all the problems of the big city. So, um, each each of our offices in the U.S. and and also overseas, um, they all operate um, with their own distribution their own finance, their own marketing, and their own sales. So we tie it all in together, and of course, we have a very, very strong uh, MIS um, division, and uh, we know every color, every style, you know, instantly is it sold. Um, also, all the counting, too, all is linked together. But you, you just really have to realize that every country is, is very different, and you have to listen to those people, and, and you have to let them do their own thing. So, um, and then, for instance, the example, um, we have, again, you saw the uh, prescription lab. We do, for instance, uh, prescriptions, glasses, and we were selling in the, in the U.S., and putting out what we thought was a pretty good product. And then when we opened our German office, um, you know, they all started coming back and these complaints that, you know, your quality is just not there. And so interesting enough that, that um, of course, in the overseas market, the, the prescription part is so advanced than the U.S. And uh, it really made us open our eyes and bring that level of quality up. And we knew if, if we could make a German customer very happy with our finished product, then we just wow someone in America. And that's what happened. It just brought that standard all the way up for these different countries. And, and I think that's sort of neat. But as far as employees, I think it just adds to the mix. It's, it's, it's so neat to get all these people together and, and kind of uh, with that common thread. Okay, now I'm going to talk about strategies and long-term goals. <laughs> Here's my, that's my bird Jimmy and this is my two dogs. <laughs> um, one, as, as I talked about, we have very thin layers of management. We really try to empower those people to make a decision and, and not all these checks and balances. Um, and I think, too, really recognize your markets, market and make sure you focus on that. Um, we talked a little bit about that for my business, it's really important that we have something that's different from our competition and exclusive. Um, we try to make a plan that's, that's attainable, but I think the most important part of this to make a plan that's obtainable that you really get input and a commitment from those people that are responsible for carrying out that plan. Um, bigger is not better. You don't, uh, don't be fooled by that. It's uh, it usually uh, bigger comes uh, with some, some hooks in it. So, um, my suggestion is be careful of that. I had a long time ago a large account come to me and say, we want to put you in a thousand stores. And, and at the time, um, it would have meant that I would have had to go to the bank to, to borrow that uh, money for the inventory. Anyway, I turned around and, and went down and met with them and said, I need uh, a letter of credit really to do this. So it's kind of just with the employees. I asked them for their commitment too. And the first meeting that I had with them, they said, well, we just don't do that. And I said, well, I understand that. And, you know, unfortunately, then we don't want to make the commitment either. But a week later, they called me back and said, okay, we're ready to do that. So, so be careful of just bigger. <laughs> um, and I think it's important too that all the divisions of your company are on an equal basis. You know, sales, service, advertising, 
Um, it seems like a lot of companies just focus on sales and all these things for sales. And, and if, if, if you don't have the people in the back servicing your end customer and your retail customers and, and your salespeople out there, you, you don't have anything. So, um, and, and also avoid short-term term goals that might be harmful towards your long-term goals. Um, it's, I see a lot of, especially public companies, really try to push the numbers where they have to have this number at the end of the quarter so that you know, the, the world doesn't uh, collapse. But um, usually that comes back to bite you. So you just, I think it's um, important that you, you pick a long-term policy and stick with it. Um, I think flexibility is very important too. You know, the world's changing every day. Sometimes um, we need to change with it. Um, I always ask myself um, on every question or every decision that I make that is, is this right for the big picture? So, and what I mean by that is that, um, let me give you an example. If, if I took repairs, there's companies out there that, that will tell, tell me that they can fix a glass and ship it out and do it cheaper than I can. But if we did that, would they get the same touch from us? Because um, we just get so many few chances to touch our customer. Um, so it might be a little bit more expensive, but I find that that in the end, it can be your, your strength. So, and just like shipping, you'll have companies come in, we can warehouse it, ship it, do it all, but they can't do it like, like you can do it yourself. And I think in the end, you can't separate different divisions and say, well, we can save money on that, but make sure if, that if you can save money, that it doesn't affect the big picture, and that's what I'm saying. Okay, and in closing, <laughs> I see a lot of yawns out there. <laughs> um, again, the, the most important thing is people, and, and everyone wants, wants to be treated um, with respect. And, uh, but you have to listen and gather as much information and knowledge as you can every day. You really need to strive to improve yourself every day. Uh, again, treat others as you'd want to be treated. And bottom line, your, your reputation's everything. Um, it really is. Um, with a little luck and some good timing, um, if you do all these things, you would have created a brand. But uh, most of all, if you do these things, somehow you end up with a company culture, which is uh, very dear. But um, I really want to thank you for your time today, and I, I hope you walk away with the knowledge that Aloha has much more meaning than just hello and goodbye. Thank you. I have a pair of Maui gyms and I love them. They're my favorite sunglasses. And I think part of it is because the Aloha spirit does transfer transfer through to what I'm wearing. I don't feel like I can frown in these things. I just I'm laid back. <laughs> and I'm not trying to run. You know, I'm not a plan in the audience. I'm not trying to run a pitch here. But uh, I guess my question to you is: Do you think you could make the same product without having this corporate culture? No, and I, and I think we've proved that because although the products changed um, from when the company went bankrupt, 
I mean, it was uh, it was a good product at the time. It was just a, a gray lens and four styles, but um, we've changed that a lot. But it really comes down to the people, um, no question. And hopefully, if if you meet some of our employees, I think I think you'll see a difference from other people, and that's that's what makes us different. No question. Would you like to say anything, Dan? It's, it's the integrity and trust that you build over the years that pays off big. No question. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious, uh, as when you expand in other cultures, other languages, uh, how you interview people to hire them, what's the process? Well, we usually go to, I would say, like the stores and people that would, would want to sell our product. We ask those people who's the best people in the industry. And that kind of gets us started. Um, we do require that those people also have a sec second language in English because we do need to communicate. Um, but really through the, you know, just the interview process, and then we will bring them in and they interview all our officers and our people. And we just ask them questions and really they come back with a little scorecard. And uh, I think one of the things that we've done too, we've, we've left areas open. I mean, even a year, or year and a half, just because we didn't feel like we had the high caliber person. I mean, we had people applying for the job, but we just wanted to wait out for maybe just a little higher caliber so so it's really we make sure that we do the right thing but uh, the the sunglass business and opticals a very small group of people it's 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 the same ones over and over too so it's a small community you, you get to know the people uh, pretty quickly I hope I answered your question if not my human resources <laughs> vice president's up here <laughs> she could give you a better better overview. <laughs> yeah, Tom. Um, I'm, I think last year I probably, I don't know, maybe 350. I did 200,000 with one airline, so. Um, so, three something, I don't know. <laughs> Keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> Somewhat. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, you say you don't sell your product to the end user, only to retailers. When the end user has a problem, uh, do they go to the retailer they bought it or they go to your, to the company? Um, they can go to both. A lot of people like to go back to the store that they bought it in, but on our brochures, we have our number, so it's just really whoever they contact first. Sometimes the stores will say it's easier just to call us, but but um, so they can go either way. But most of the stores like to take care of their customer too, just as we do. So, And uh, in terms of marketing, what were your first steps in getting your product known? And were there like, what were your problems at first? Um, good question. Uh, we kind of did it a little bit differently. We really sort of um, guerrilla marketing, sort of word of mouth. Um, we really hit, hit the taking care of the customers, the warranty hard. Um, we went for point of sale in the stores. And we really, in doing that, we backed that up with training. So we tried to, the people that are working in the store, tried to make them feel comfortable with selling our product, that they knew everything. That someone, you know, you don't want to introduce a product in, unless you know it inside and out. So we provided that training. Also in store we do 
what we call POP point of sale. And um, we also believe that, um, you know, an employee can really change a person's decision. Maybe they walked in for what they thought they wanted this product, but when they heard about the benefits of this product, they would switch at that, at that time. Um, we went through a lot of different changes. We, we had about, uh, actually about, I don't know, 20 years of du double digit growth. We actually had to slow down some things because we were just more comfortable with that. Um, probably last year is one of the first years that we were kind of flat. And so we're even looking at new ways that we can advertise too. So, so. Uh, do you think that being an ethical company and having an ethical reputation makes it easier to find suppliers and retailers that are willing to work with you, especially early when you were growing? No question, but, but I think um, you have to have a track record too, but there's only one way to get a track record and just be consistent. But um, it's no question that the two companies that, that I really deal with mainly um, if they develop any type of new technology, they will bring it to me first. And, and also our name is kind of out in the industry too. As I said, it's sort of a small community, but these people, even inventors, will bring stuff to us because they know that you know we're not gonna just rip them off and then sign something and then tear it up. So. I've been fortunate enough to deal with Walter and uh, members of the Maui Gym team via email over the course of the last couple of years. And uh, one of the things I've noticed is that every email begins with aloha and ends with mahalo, thank you, in Hawaii. And on behalf of the entire Westminster community, I want to say mahalo for your fabulous and inspirational talk and for all you're doing to live the Westminster mission every day on behalf of the world. Thank you very much. Let's give Walter Hester a